So welcome to IFRI for a real in-person event. It's not too often the case, so uh, I do appreciate your, your coming, but I can see that uh, people are now used to staying in their, uh, in their home, comfortably uh, sit on their sofas and they no longer move, which is too bad. Well, anyway, so we are very lucky this afternoon to have with us uh, Simon Tay, who is, so I will list all his various positions. Uh, he is first the director of the Singapore Institute, yeah. chairman, sorry for that, of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. He is also professor of law at uh, Singapore National University, or National University of Singapore in the US, and uh, also uh, ambassador to Greece. So many positions, many hats. And so this is why I think he is particularly well placed to discuss Singapore's position and Singapore's perspective on world affairs. And to uh, react to his talk, we have with us uh, also this afternoon, De Finales, who is professor at uh, Inalco, Longzhou, Paris. And she will yeah, react, comment, uh, criticize. So, well, <laughs> perhaps, yeah, we'll, we'll see whatever she wants to, to say about uh, Simon's um, remarks. So, Simon, the floor is yours for uh, yeah, some 20 minutes. And the point is for you to provide Singapore's perspective on global events. Of course, the war in Ukraine will be very much the focus of the talk, but we will go, I guess, beyond that. And uh, you will address also great power politics, great power rivalry, how Singapore sees its role in this uh, com well, complicated uh, context. So floor is yours for 20 minutes. Thank you very much, um, Francois. And thank you, Ifri, for hosting me. And as she said, many of you coming in real life, uh, it's good to see some people back in this sort of post-pandemic, not quite over, but post-pandemic living we're getting used to. Uh, Francois kindly introduced me, uh, and I'm the non-resident ambassador to Greece. But I want to say in that sense, when I'm in Greece, I have to every single word I say scripted by the Singapore government. And here, I don't have to. Uh, so uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Singapore government. I'm happy to share a Singaporean perspective. But actually, I wish to also use the fact that I've just been in Kuala Lumpur, or Malaysia, uh, Bangkok, and try to share uh, the ASEAN perspective. The Singapore Institute of International Affairs, in that sense, tries to be not just the counterpart of IFRI and other Institute of International Affairs. We look at ASEAN and Asia and use that as a kind of lens of seeing the rest of the world. Uh, so that's, I guess, my foolish ambition to suggest what the ASEAN perspectives of some of these issues might be. I, I want to also say that um, I'm doing so because I want to hear back, I think, on certain global issues. While they affect us all, we are very differently affected and differently situated, and perhaps none more so than Ukraine. Then from there, uh, I'll talk about the ASEAN perspectives on that war going on in Europe. But I also want to share that analogy that many draw perhaps too readily to the situation in Asia and particularly the situation regarding Taiwan, uh, which I've just visited in January with very good meetings. And my last point will be about some of the ASEAN and Asian priorities that don't relate to this Ukraine war or Sino-American tensions and question of Taiwan, but really a post-pandemic perspective about the priorities of stability, growth, and some of the problem, other problems we have in this world. Uh, but let me focus on the first two, and we can always get to the broader stuff a bit later. Uh, I'd say that first, in terms of my understanding of the European perspective, uh, I want to thank a number of people for sharing viewpoints with me, most recently Victor Mallet over dinner last night. Uh, my own view is that uh, we in Asia and ASEAN do not necessarily understand how it's been escalating and escalating nonstop. Um, I think like people more removed, we're getting a bit inured to the headlines. I, I know it sounds terrible given the scale of tragedy and suffering, but 
that is a factor for people. Uh, headline exhaustion plus the distance. Um, and I would say that if anything within the Asian context, Singapore stands out for having taken this war very seriously from the start. Just to recap, my little country basically has drawn a line and also committed to sanctions against Russia, which is very unusual for us unless they are fully endorsed UN Security Council resolutions, which by law we automatically enforce. So as you know, because of Russia's own veto, this is not the case here. So it is, in a sense, a very legalistic stance, very different for us to take sanctions here. Having said that, our sanctions, if you were to examine them, are very narrow compared to the breadth and to degree a certain determined uncertainty of the sanctions in America and Russia. To sum it up, basically, if you go to a banker in Singapore, he's not really concerned about our sanctions because they're quite easily reportable under the MAS. They instead will be looking at the long arm reach of either European and especially American regulators. So Singapore is Singaporean banks and other foreign entities in Singapore are complying, but they're much more complying with the American and European sanctions. We are not at all uh, arbitraging this, like perhaps some other financial centers in the world, but we are not on the West side in that sense. Um, on that plane, I also get a lot of questions of Singapore has chosen to be on the Western side. I want to say what our government has been saying quite strongly. They're actually on the side of international rules. In this case, there is a recognized border recognized internationally and recognized by Russia, which has been you know, played with. Right? Maybe playing the with is too light a word. We do so because we too have various controversies about the sovereignty and borders of Singapore. So in this sense, uh, our government, our prime minister and down have said this is a clear existential threat to Singapore in terms of if borders in Europe agreed by treaty are not respected, then what are borders between Singapore and its neighbors. Now, having said that Singapore's position is first, not in the Western camp, but on this narrow legalistic basis, and that we have also taken sanctions. I want to say in a sense, um, we have tried to be not against Russia, simply what Russia is doing. I know this is a diplomatic line of thinking, and it's not saved us from being considered by Russia to be an unfriendly state. But again, in a way, it is uh, an important uh, differentiator from what we see in Europe. Here, it is very much a popular cause. Um, we see many people wearing yellow and blue in you know, allegiance or sympathy to uh, Ukraine. We can respect that. But I think I would say the general population of Singapore may be aware of the human suffering but is equally concerned about the space left for Russia, for uh, China, in what the Biden administration has emphasized to be a war of democracy against autocracy, this contestation at an ideological sense. Not just Singapore, but many of the Asian and ASEAN countries were not invited to the Biden administration's uh, democracy jamboree. Um, and when we were not invited, I don't believe the Singapore government fought to be included either. We were happy to be left outside. Uh, in this sense, that's the main difference I see. Uh, what's first, it is this proximity issue, the, 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 the existential visceral feeling that many in Europe might have about the war being so near. The second, is the basis of which we are united is more of a legalism. And the third is that uh, I would say if you poll Singaporeans, there are of course the humanitarians who care about it. There are many more who start to think about the other issues. Most recently, our Minister of Home Affairs, who was our foreign minister, but no longer is, he's probably given a speech where he is given voice to the question of whether NATO really did the right thing in its expansion. And 
again, he, like I, are saying that we stick by the principle you cannot cross a border no matter what people do to you. But he was openly asking the question, which many people listening to China list talk about, whether one security becomes the other's insecurity. Yeah. And I think that's where, again, there are shades of difference about this very real problem. Uh, if we look at the beyond Singapore, and it's important to look beyond my small country, no matter how loudly we speak, um, and really see that there are very different views. Um, Cambodia, uh, who was ASEAN chair the year that it broke out, uh, has turned around and called it an act of aggression uh, and ordered his diplomats to vote for the UN resolution condemning Russia's invasion. And he has reached out to Zelensky when he was ASEAN chair, in the sense uh, it's been more active than people would have thought. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, uh, the Philippines has also shifted towards a certain degree of rebuke. Uh, uh, in May 2022, the former president, Duarte, then president rather, uh, talked about the uh, calling out full-scale war calling up Putin for its uh, uh, effects on the children and elderly. Uh, but it did not, it scrapped the deals to buy uh, military helicopters. Uh, and the Marcos administration, current president, has also moved closer towards America. Uh, but I'll explain that or discuss that briefly in the sino American sort of section. Uh, but while that is the position, a number of the other countries are really much more balancing between neutrality and condemnation, including the largest country, Indonesia. Perhaps this was necessary because it was the G20 chairman uh, and really dedicated towards trying to get all the key issues on the table and make sure that Russia was not either disinvited or felt that it should not come. So this showcased Indonesia's long obsession about its non-alignment and its desire to be inclusive. And that kind of influences how ASEAN sees its role. Brunei, Malaysia, Thailand have more or less said the same thing. And uh, Thailand particularly, uh, the second largest economy, has talked about the long-standing relations between the Thais and the Russia uh, to be taken into account in its neutrality. Of course, this was said by former general, now Prime Minister Prayut, leading to people wondering whether it's a military to military sort of uh, empathy thing. Um, I shouldn't say more, I hope to go back to Thailand one day. Um, now, refusal to condemn, um, I think Vietnam is the leading case. Vietnam is on many senses everyone's investment darling. Uh, it has consistently abstained uh, on UN resolutions and refrained from calling this an invasion or war. I think to me, I have some empathy for its reasons, very real politic reasons. Its defense supplies come from Russia, as well as there is a generation of elderly uh, Vietnamese who have, they are holding degrees based on Soviet Union friendship scholarships. Many of them went to Moscow or to East Germany and learned there. And these people are not has-beens. In fact, Vietnam is all run by quite powerfully this old clique. But more to the point, I want to add this quickly. The difference between Vietnam and Singapore on this issue of Ukraine is real, but it should not be overstressed. Because from this mapping of the different national positions, some suggest that UN ASEAN is somehow disunified and inability to act. Now, as between Singapore and Vietnam, in this year, these two years of the one year plus of the Ukraine problem, Ukraine war, um, Vietnam and Singapore, despite their national differences on these uh, stance regarding Russia, we have signed a huge number of MOUs, we exchanged visits between our leaders, and we're pursuing growth in digital and green economies. So basically, uh, um, Yes, the, this issue is a, a matter of difference, but the positions that the different countries take is understood enough by the other ASEAN party 
so that it does not become an obstacle to direct bilateral and intra-ASEAN cooperation. It does disempower ASEAN from taking a group stance. But to my mind, while noting the differences, no ASEAN member government has called Singapore to fall in line with the others. And similarly, I don't believe Singapore's job is to convince Vietnam or others to try to get on board the same platform. In this sense, we are happy about differences, allowing them. And I know the European position on this is and will be quite different. Uh, though I, I, I imagine that as this war, which has been escalating, continues, the national differences of situation, how close you are to the front, what the impacts are, how much you can bear the cost of energy, et cetera. All these will play out. Uh, and I hope that Europe, European Union can remain a unified position. And we have pushed it quite the other way. Um, let me move on in the little time I have left to the Sino-American. This is the biggest issue, but I was asked to focus, so I put it second. Many times I would say the Russia issue is a surrogate of the China uh, potential war uh, between, and it's been talked up perhaps a bit too much. I must say, I'm not one who believes that the actual chance of high level conflict, high intensity conflict is very real. Uh, there might be incident at sea, there might be some skirmishes, but I don't see that China would risk at this stage of development an all-out confrontation with America in an actual physical military conflict. The economic competition already is so tense and so uh, draining on the Chinese that they must be rethinking again some of the things and how to approach it. In that context, in my view about Taiwan, I must say most of us do not agree with some American assessments that if invasion is being planned for the near term. Now, I will, of course, take Xi Jinping and most Chinese at their word to say that reunification is non-negotiable. But the flexibility of that word reunification and the means to achieve it is something that we can discuss. Uh, a number of us think that Xi would be much better off to focus presently on growth, uh, ensuring internal stability as he tackles a number of the problems and kicking that can down the road a bit, provided, and he's been quite open about this, Taiwan does not go and declare actual independence. Now, in my meetings in Taiwan, and I can't say they're definitive, we find that the Taiwanese also have no appetite for war. Uh, they, I think, Many people take the point about how China has looked at Ukraine and realized the difficulty and high cost, difficulty militarily, high cost both of the war, but much more the sanctions. But I would say the Taiwanese too have taken a lesson. They cannot but look at Ukraine and while probably emphasizing their sympathy and support, they must be hoping not to be the Ukrainians. And I think that is shown by the fact that there is any number of surveys to show that Taiwanese do not think a war is on the cards. And most recently, when the Chai Ing-wen government wanted to raise military conscription for four months to a full year, uh, there was strong public reaction against it. Um, they asked me about it and I said, well, in Singapore, with no clear enemy, as far as I know, uh, we, we served two years of national service so, you know, to me, we're paying a price which the Taiwanese refuse to pay uh, in preparation of war or deterrence uh, preparation. The Sino American tensions, I've written about it, and I just want to reiterate some top points in the time I've got. I really regret that there might be a cold war, let alone a hot one. But since the time I've been writing this, uh, it's becoming real, and I cannot run away from the reality. But in this period, I would say Singapore, Indonesia, and most of ASEAN still refuse to choose and to find a way to instead to connect to each side. 
Um, that's very clear in Singapore's position. We are not allies, but strategic partners of America. We, unlike some of the other ASEAN members, have not criticized AUKUS strongly. Uh, we have encouraged and talked to Japan about their own new security strategy, which is much more clearly uh, uh, challenging to China, um, responding to the challenge of China, I would say. Um, we've just had the Singapore-Japan dialogue uh, at the track 1.5 level. And I would say that um, I, I believe that for Singapore, this is natural. Um, we also feel it's natural to want to do uh, business and seek opportunity in China when it's rational to do so. But we will not let this cloud our judgment of what is right for Singapore. So we intend to do business with China when it makes sense to do so. And our business community will not have it any other way. The greatest opportunity in Asia, maybe with ASEAN more, but still at 5%, which is low for China, China can't be written off. Uh, and that allows me to conclude, if I may, on what I call the other priorities. We've emerged into a very dark place in the world. We've done so after being trapped in the dark place of our homes. Maybe you've had a very happy pandemic experience. I haven't had a bad one because my profession allows me to talk on Zoom for a living, teaching similarly, et cetera. But I tell you that uh, the developing countries of ASEAN and the poorer communities of ASEAN have not had such a good time. We therefore see that there is every need to have a comprehensive recovery from the pandemic. We are emphasizing in the sense a return to growth. We are trying to emphasize, of course, not growth for its own sake, but to generate the income to put back some of those earnings into our government coffers, which have been, not Singapore, but many countries in the region have been really drained by the effort to help their citizens through the pandemic. We also have to see that there's a lot of fixing to do. We're going through a bit of pandemic amnesia, but the health systems of ASEAN and Asia were really seen to have been run down. This is probably true in some other countries in the West too. But when you're trying to be a proud independent country like Indonesia, India, proud you're part of the G20, in fact, sharing G20, it can't be but a sore point to see your health system brought so low and help so few people. We have the broader issue of inequality, and I know growth does not cure that. I'm the country of Thomas Piketty, after all. Um, but we do really think that the water levels have to go up in tandem with broader tax policies and better social spending and investment. So issues about growth, about climate change as both a threat, but also an opportunity for new investments, infrastructure, beggar the question of where are those investments coming from? Where are we supposed to accept money from and where are we not? And this leads me back to the China question. China, for all its demerit points, remains not just the opportunity of doing business, but one of the few people ready to invest in the countries around it. Uh, and of course, even further afield. China is also prepared to try to be seen to play a role. The Iranian uh, Saudi Arabia deal surprised me. I'm still trying to understand how it, it reached its point without most of us knowing it was happening. In this sense, we have to watch China, not only just domestically, but in its role in terms of what it's trying to do about Ukraine. Many more Asians than I uh, will give it that chance. Uh, I think that while the odds are against it, if, we, if people believe that the constant escalation of the Ukraine conflict which we've seen cannot go on forever, if we secondly believe that there will be some kind of Russia uh, after this is done, and better a stable Russia than one that is really post-Putin falling apart into perhaps worse habits. Uh, you know, I, I think that really uh, um, we should be giving some space to Xi 
to try to figure out what China and he can do uh, and, and wants to do. Um, and at some point, I think those in the European Union who are much closer to the issue will have to take this issue back and figure out how to come with some just settlement of a otherwise seeming escalating intractable problem. Please allow me to stop there and take comments and, of course, uh, questions. Well, thank you, Simon. So the, the floor is now to uh, you, Delphine. But before you, you take the floor, let me remind uh, the people online that they may ask their questions through the uh, chat box or a Q&A box. So if you want to weigh in uh, virtually, you may. Delphine, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, François. Thank you very much, Simon, for this presentation. Please let me first say again, I was mentioning this uh, earlier when we were speaking before the, the conference, that I first entered Southeast Asia and international relations from Singapore about 18 years ago. So it's always a pleasure for me uh, to be back, at least virtually, to Singapore through uh, a talk well, hoping that I will uh, be able to set foot on the island uh, in the next couple of, um, of uh, weeks. So, um, Simon, you rightly said uh, at the beginning of your um, presentation that ASEAN has been and is very differently affected uh, by world affairs, be it the pandemic, uh, the Ukraine crisis, the, Southeast, um, uh, the South China Sea crisis, or, of course, uh, the Taiwan issues that are clearly very different and diverging even uh, perspectives, uh, especially about Ukraine with Singapore, as you said, adopting uh, even narrow, but uh, at least a regime of sanctions against uh, Russia with Myanmar, clearly following uh, and siding with the Russian government, with Indonesia trying to play the role of a middleman in the Ukraine crisis. And from my perspective, this also reflects different, um, probably diverging perceptions about priorities um, regarding the security impact of the crisis, with Singapore seeing the Ukraine crisis, as you said, in terms of hard security, uh, fearing the possibility of a precedent that might give ideas uh, potentially to some of its neighbors, while for other states um, in the region, Indonesia in particular, the Ukraine crisis is first of all a matter of human security, food security, um, uh, energy uh, security, and of course, and so the concerns are different uh, with regards to security. Now, despite these differences, ASEAN uh, has signed a Treaty of Amity and Cooperation with Ukraine last November. Um, Ukraine was the 50th country, I think, uh, to sign a Treaty of Amity and Cooperation with um, uh, ASEAN. And I was wondering from your perspective, to what extent these could leave room for a potential ASEAN convergence uh, on the issue? Do you think it is possible? And if so, if, the, if it is the case, on what grounds do you think that ASEAN could come to terms uh, and find a common ground? I mean, what would be the lowest common denominator, as it is always the case uh, in ASEAN negotiations, if ASEAN were to finally take a stance uh, regarding the uh, Ukraine crisis beyond, of course, the call for peace, uh, which is not really the lowest uh, common um, uh, denominator? Um, I have a second series, perhaps, of uh, remarks and, and, and questions. You were very prudent uh, to mention that Singapore's sanctions uh, against Russia do not um, make Singapore a member of the West or of a, a Western uh, bloc that do not equate uh, to sanctions that were adopted by the United States or by the European Union. And that leads me to a question about, you know, the comeback of the whole uh, Global South uh, idea, the comeback of non-aligned um, narratives, and I was wondering to what extent this makes sense, um, again, from a Singaporean um, uh, perspective. Do you think uh, that the current international context will change, to some extent, Singapore's involvement in what could be considered as the most structured you know, Global South um, um, uh, grouping circles, such as the non-aligned movement or the G77, within which Singapore has been a member, but a member with a quite uh, muted um, uh, participation in, in recent years. Do you think Singapore will consider that uh, those circles have been made more relevant uh, by the Ukraine crisis? And are these arenas that are considered as increasingly um, uh, significant from a Singaporean or ASEAN, um, uh, for that matter, um, perspective? 
I, I have a third um, question or, or series of questions, perhaps a bit more broadly, about the evolution uh, of the uh, regional security architecture in Southeast Asia and in Asia uh, in, in general. ASEAN, uh, as we know, used to be the normative force uh, in the regional um, uh, security architecture. ASEAN used to be at the center of concentric circles with the East Asia uh, Summit, with the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, with the uh, ASEAN Defense Ministers uh, Meeting Plus, etc. But this normative agency seems to have um, retreated to some extent, especially in the context of the Indo-Pacific hype and uh, the increasing involvement of external powers uh, in, the, in, the, in the region, and of course, in the context of, so of, of, of tensions uh, around Taiwan, which have also to some extent uh, reduced the coherence uh, or the potential for coherence of these um, groupings. So I would also like to ask to what extent um, do you think that ASEAN's agency still matters in the regional security um, architecture? Um, and do you think that in this context, ASEAN's outlook for the Indo-Pacific uh, you know, has the potential about three years after its publication to structure uh, cooperation in the region. It was considered as a bit disappointing by a number of commentators in the region and from the region. And I would like uh, to know what is your assessment about three years after its um, uh, publication? And I have those questions, but I, I might uh, uh, leave room for the discussion. We can go back later. Well, thank you, Delphine. Well, I particularly appreciate the, the question about the global south, which is something that I find particularly interesting. It seems to me that the war in Ukraine has precisely shown that there is such a thing like a global south. I mean, there is some kind of a group that doesn't belong to any other camps and that does exist. And this is something that we have, perhaps in the West, a uh, tendency to perhaps... Uh, either downplay, ignore, or uh, neglect. I, I don't know exactly how to put it. Uh, and so I, I would really like to hear what you have to say about this and the role of Singapore as perhaps the uh, yeah, speaker or something, or the voice of the global south. I don't know, but that's a particularly interesting question, I, I think. So you have plenty on your plate. And I so, I... yeah, I, I well, I give you the uh, back. Yeah, right now, and then there will be uh, further questions, but I, I think you have uh, quite a lot to yes. respond to. I think Delphine has asked some very hard, good questions, and um, I thought she was cheating a bit. I thought as commentator, she should be helping me a bit more to explicate the topic, but you know, I'm just joking with cheating. Um, I'm happy to answer them and share views, because I think embedded in the questions are uh, your own views, Delphine, which I appreciate. First, on the sense of a, a, a NAM, a new online movement narrative, um, the Institute and I have talked about it, and so has our foreign minister. But I, none of this talk was about really Singapore being that voice. I think if there is to be a non-aligned movement, a new type, it will be probably Indonesia and India. Uh, India particularly strikes me as being in a particularly interesting position. And I say this very carefully, since Victor Mallet used to be the chief of the bureau in India, lived there much longer than I or anybody who had a choice would, would do, because uh, it's tough living in India and very exciting, but very tough. Um, I would say that first, if you look at India today, it is part of almost every group. You know, It's part of that non-aligned movement by heritage and consistently in voice. It's got a certain amount of relationships with Russia, Yet it's part of the Quad, uh, is being wooed by America in many ways. Uh, with China, it is the one country that's clearly got a you know, real problem with China besides America, and for much stronger reasons, I think, than America, uh, with you know, border skirmishes and wars before. Uh, so in this sense, I think in terms of figuring out who has the weight and the kind of uh, present uh, uh, leeway to play that non-aligned role, I don't think it will be Singapore. I think if Singapore has a kind of role, I think it's kind of maybe a Switzerland or just Vienna, you know, of, uh, of uh, the new Cold War. But precisely even that role, I think it would be our positioning that uh, to be touching both sides, not able to mediate between them because the differences get too rough, but at least finding some value because no matter how we bifurcate the world, 
there must be points of contact that uh, to some degree have a, a basis of trust to, you know, say the same thing to each side uh, and mean it. And I think this is where it will play to Singapore's relative weaknesses of being a very small state and its relative strengths of being that financial transport and other hubs that we aspire to. And politically, to have that a certain degree of trust uh, with the two main sides. Now, uh, in the sense of the overall G77 or NAM narrative, I don't necessarily see it so easily though, because you know, as we investigate further, there are any number of um, subdivisions, right? Uh, if we look at, say, uh, um, India, I've already done that. Uh, but if you look at, say, the NATO plus four countries, uh, I think Korea is very different from Japan in terms of its attitude, present attitude to where China is. I mean, it's clearly emphasizing the relationship with America, the present administration, but starting from a much lower point than Japan is. <coughs> and New Zealand is clearly going along, but it's not part of ACUS, right? Secondly, I'd say that uh, in these alignments, the other fluidity is not only the, uh, it's not just a question of how you compartmentalize them, but the shifts of administration. Uh, you see that the leadership flip flops in elections in these countries from the Philippines, from Duterte to uh, 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 Marcos, and before him, Aquino for that, uh, have really made the position with China and therefore America change. Under the Duterte government, I remember Mike Pompeo trying to tell his counterpart in the Philippines that, don't worry, the treaty covers it. You know, if you're threatened, we both will be going in. And the, <coughs> the defense foreign secretary of the Philippines were actually more concerned that it be dragged in by an America and Pompeo. So these personalities do in a sense make a vast amount of difference. So the alignments <coughs> may be shifting, but there's no clear groupings that really emerge at this point. From there, I'd like to invent a word that is not neutrality, but rather um, a kind of relevance to each side. So if uh, equidistant meant you seem distant from everybody, the word I tried to invent in my 20 12 book was <coughs> equiproximate. It completely failed. That's why you've never heard the word. <clears throat> but the idea, I hope, is something to share again, that the idea is that countries should be trying to be as relevant to each other as possible. And that's where we'll start to look, not just in terms of groupings, but really in terms of much more even bilateral and other stances. In this period of the pandemic, my little country <clears throat> has become the first observer of something called... <clears throat> something called the um, Pacific Alliance, which is Chile, Peru, uh, Colombia, and Mexico, right across the other end of the world. I mentioned this not because the trade flows be that much, but we spend a, a great deal of time trying to link to like-minded countries no matter where in the world they are. We're hoping in a sense also to link to the European Union in a new way, which is why I'm on the way to Brussels. We have a FTA with the European Union, despite some differences in various things doing sustainability, CBAM kind of stuff. We, we think overall, the emphasis that Europeans give to rules is very important. So in that sense, I partly disagree with what Francois said, or rather the flip side. She said that the circumstance of Ukraine has shown us there is something called the developing world. Uh, I will tease you back by saying the Ukraine war has shown us there is a West. Whereas uh, I was telling a couple of friends, including Victor, that I still remember Macron, President Macron saying at the start of the conflict, there must be an independent European position, which I've not seen. Uh, would one emerge? And would one, not just about the Ukraine war, but on other issues, are there other interlocutors we can play with in the West who see things slightly more like uh, Singapore or ASEAN? If you look at climate change, for example, while the European position has been quite solidly consistent, Again, going back to personality, it's not just the president of the Philippines that can change things. Look at the climate change position of the last four American presidents. 
you just can't figure out what America is going to do next uh, on this very important issue. Uh, I should let people come in and make comments for all the absurd things I'm saying. So here, I think maybe I should close off with the fact that in terms of ASEAN as a normative force, a big challenge a question, and I think it's one I take seriously. The chance of a common stance vis-a-vis -vis China is actually quite limited if it's meant to be quite progressive. Um, I think to take a strong position on the South American would split ASEAN. That's why I mentioned in my own way, the understanding each of us has about each other and the, what's the European term? Uh, uh, differentiation principle. You allow each country to vary their position. Um, I think we've taken it more to extreme. We will have trouble defining vis-a-vis -vis China a common base. There will be some no-go areas. On the Ukraine as well, I must say that one of the things we thought, I thought, I shouldn't say we, thought China did a pretty good job was to openly state that uh, the threat or use of nuclear weapons or attack on a nuclear power station is against uh, their stance. And I think compared to a year ago when we talked about the friendship without limits, I think this showed me that there was some idea of limit and it's not bad for China, at least, I mean, it's not what Europeans might have said, but it's you're not China and China is not you. So the fact that China is putting any kind of line, and again, I be proven wrong in a few days time, um, uh, uh, I think we have to give some hope to the fact that China will find a space of its own to try to play a role. And similarly, ASEAN. Now ASEAN, I think in terms of the Indo-Pacific efforts, it's not just AOIP, the ASEAN outlook in the Pacific. The key difference is that we want it to be inclusive. We want uh, RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Partnership, rather than uh, CPTPP, which is, you know, Obama always intended to keep China out. It probably pains the Americans to see China putting its name in the hat, whereas America won't even put its name in the hat. Um, we have to see that ASEAN continues to be relevant because its job is not a security job. Its job is to try to create dialogue and hopefully engender some trust. In this sense, ACUS creates more role for ASEAN, whether, because it creates more distrust. Uh, whether, of course, ASEAN can play that role, it's a real challenge. When we did all those things you talked about, Francois, it was really a time where Sino-American tensions were much more reduced. That we remember it wasn't that long ago, in the first Obama administration, they talked about G2 and working together on a broad range of issues. I know it sounds like a previous civilization, and maybe it is a different world now. But in this sense, ASEAN will continue to try that fundamental role. And in this sense, uh, I hope that ASEAN, uh, without guarantee of success, enjoys support in the valiant effort. Is that okay? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, all right. So we opened the uh, the discussion. So anybody, the mic is uh, coming to you. So can you please introduce yourself briefly and then ask your question? Thank you. I'm Victor Mallet from the Financial Times, although I'm currently on sabbatical and I, I was the bureau chief here in Paris and. Uh, as Simon mentioned, I was also based in India and, and in Asia for, for, for many years. Um, I just have a question really about the, the kind of different narratives of the war, particularly the narratives that the Russians are putting out and that which the Chinese are also putting out very strongly, that this is basically NATO's fault for being expansionist and so on. And obviously the Western narrative is, well, you know, NATO is only expanding now because Russia invaded Ukraine. And I just wonder how those things kind of play out in Southeast Asia in particular, but among Asian countries in general. I mean, it seems to me that it's quite an important question as to how, uh, you know, how governments kind of, who they believe essentially and, and which argument they, they accept. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to hear that Singapore is, is saying, you know, don't want to be a, an ally of the US necessarily in this war, but we do want to support, uh, you know, Singapore wants to support the rule of law and international law, and that means not invading a sovereign sovereign country. So I just wonder how how those kind of arguments are playing out in, uh, especially in kind of Asian countries, whether India or ASEAN or anywhere else. Thanks. If there is 
Yeah. No other questions so far? No? Okay. So, yeah. Please. Yes, I referred to Victor earlier. Uh, Victor is too shy to admit it, but he wrote one of the early books about the Asian crisis, uh, The Trouble, Trouble of Tigers, which I thought did well, but he just told me it didn't do as well. Maybe I, we both agree it didn't do as well as it should have. It was a good book. He's written a much more recent book about India and the Ganges. Um, now, uh, I think you've asked me a, a very tough question in terms of not just what the narrative is, but you know, my own sort of take on it, uh, especially regarding NATO's fault. Um, I would say that for a long time, this idea that NATO's fault has been there in the sort of the, you know the, the ether, uh, talked about by business people, people who you know not policymakers. The first one who really has voiced it is, as I said, my home affairs minister, the former foreign minister, who is very influential in terms of our security thinking, K. Shamongam. And he put it, I think, quite diplomatically. Not once did he fail to say that he never excuses Russia for doing an international wrong. Shamongam, like me, is a lawyer. So he emphasized that. But yet he gave vent to this idea that, you know, uh, what was Russia supposed to do if, the, despite its undertakings, the Americans kept NATO expanding? And I think that what uh, the subtext is that not just him, but a number of people in Asia are wondering how that might apply to China. Because our idea is to keep trying to include China in various things. You know, to do, you, as I said, business, but RCEP diplomatically, Belt and Road, we're not saying no to because it's from China, we, where there is a rational meeting of you know, interests, we, we want to deal with China. We don't want to be bullied by China. We don't want to be owned by China. But I think to some degree, the China that is emerging knows that it can't bully and own everybody in Asia. <clears throat> and so it, I think if that's the mutual understanding of uh, this idea of independence, but interdependence, then uh, we are trying to say that efforts to really isolate China are fundamentally going to be a mistake. You know, so if I'm to take the Chinese side, I'm not sure I should, because I have a Chinese face. I don't speak Chinese. I'm not from China, right? Um, but if I was to take their side empathetically uh, on the Taiwan issue, there is a danger of a misreading that if Americans constantly, you know, sort of diplomatically and militarily uh, come in on increasingly on Taiwan's side. If Biden keeps making gaffes, how many gaffes can you make about not, you know, def about defending Taiwan before it becomes a new policy? No matter how many times they walk it back, uh, the Chinese mindset must be, are they somehow encouraging them? Now, nobody wants America to abandon Taiwan, I'm not suggesting that, but to actually encourage them. The line between deterrence and actual provocation in a tense situation is very little. And I think this is where we hope that cooler, wiser heads will prevail. Now, I, I, I mean, Singapore is a friend of Taiwan, I must say. We, are, we still have our military training in Taiwan. We don't train with the Taiwanese, but we have military assets for our training in Taiwan. We've had it since the 1970s. Uh, we continue to have them. We have a free trade agreement with Taiwan, which nobody else in ASEAN has. So we are friends of Taiwan. We never want to see them abandoned by us or others. But I think to actually push them to a point of line where China might feel it has to act, that might be something all of us regret, including the Taiwanese. Uh, if I could then add one more point, where the narrative about, say, the chips uh, 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 ruling, that's hurting many economies in Asia, in Asia. Now, some of us in ASEAN are going to gain because if you're looking for a non-China place to produce your chips, well, we're open for investment, right? We have any number of people wanting to move up the value chain. But jokes aside, I think that really this again uh, muddies the question of who is making the rules and who really is the rule abiding one. Uh, from my reading of trade rules, this isn't a security issue. This is a competitiveness issue. It is not, to my mind, GATT legal uh, to simply 
by nationality exclude uh, certain chips. Now, I don't mean the dual use chips, etc. But my knowledge of this area is that the chips they're talking about can easily bleed into the things that you put in mobile phones, cars, and even refrigerators. So that's what I mean by it's not a real security issue. I hope that's a sort of reply to my old friend, Victor. Well, thank you. Uh, I think there was another question. Uh, D David first, perhaps? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, David Camru from, from Sciences Po. Uh, I also co-coordinate the Franco-German Observatory of the Indo-Pacific, of which uh, Delphine is, is a member. Um, two questions. The first question concerns Hong Kong. Uh, one could argue that if Xi Jinping really wanted to reassure the Taiwanese about uh, peaceful reunification, the way to have done so would have been to show that one country, two systems in Hong Kong uh, is viable. And the regime has done quite the opposite. Um, so what is the impact uh, of that? And certainly, you know, Singapore has been a great beneficiary in the sense of the partial collapse of the one country, two systems, insofar as it's now attracting as a financial center uh, people and, and entrepreneurs and business people from, from Hong Kong. Uh, my second question, and I had your permission to ask this before I asked it, and I think Sophie will probably have something to add, concerns your reading of the situation in Myanmar. Um, I, I brought your book to be uh, dedicated, and you, you, your concluding chapter is um, We Must Look Beyond a Hollywood Ending. Now, the book came out before the coup d'etat, uh, but you uh, were already raising questions about the morality of the Tatmadu, the military. Um, so is the ASEAN five-point consensus of April 2021 still realistic uh, now that we're now entering into a, a fairly bloody revolutionary civil war. Thank Francoise, you. But, uh, may I uh, sure. follow up on, sure. on this question? So Marc Julien, uh, head of China Research at the Center for Asian Studies here at IFRI. I would just like to, to follow up on the, on the first question on Taiwan. You said, uh, Simon, during your talk that uh, the unification question was non-negotiable for, for China, and, but you also said that there was still, uh, there, there was still a, marg a margin of maneuver uh, in terms of discussing with China. So my, my question is, since China has in interrupted all dialogue since 2016, who is going to talk with, uh, with Beijing? Uh, Singapore may be, uh, may be uh, an actor. Uh, and who uh, Beijing is going to, to listen uh, on this uh, Taiwan case since it considered that it's a, a domestic affairs and no, nobody should interfere uh, in this uh, matter. Thank you very much. Okay, well, per perhaps back, back to you, uh, Simon, because there was a set of questions, relatively consistent set of questions, and then we'll go back to the uh, audience. Thank you, Francois. I'll take the Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, question together, if I may. Uh, I do agree with David Cameron, who also I've known for well, two decades at least, that um, in the long play, uh, China probably should have seen the way you put it, that a good example of a peaceful reunification giving sense the meaning of uh, two systems, one country, two systems, would have been uh, better in its Taiwan policy. And instead, it went completely the other way, where Tsai Ing-wen basically won a thumping big victory based on the line that, do you want to be Hong Kong? Before that, her poll numbers actually were quite poor. Um, so looking forward, I think we have to see how, with the Taiwanese election coming up again in 2024, uh, China plays its hand, and China has a hand. Um, most recently, they've let the vice chairman of KMT visit them again, uh, offering him various high uh, quality, high level meetings. And if the KMT were to come in, it wouldn't be a sort of Ma Ying Zhou type policy, but I, uh, it certainly wouldn't be like reunification at your terms, please tell me when. Um, but 
I think it would be moderated. The tension we feel, this goes back to the point about leadership does matter in terms of the coloration of where they go. But I would say my other assurance was that uh, Mr. William Lai, who is very likely to be the, the DPP's candidate, has said that he will cleave more or less to the Chai Ing-wen line. Now, Mr. Lai has in the not so long ago past, but I mean, some years ago, talked about being an agent for the independence of Taiwan, independence, not the status quo. Um, so if he cleaves to a Chai Ing-wen type of line, and I read Madam Chai's position in the green spectrum of the DEP to be quite middling, you know, she's not an extreme. Then the question is whether Beijing understands this, that while she has some quibbles about the sort of, you know, like the, the statement, et cetera, um, there is, if the DPP win, there is nobody else to talk to. Because by that time, if they were to win, then the KMT had been out of power for 10 plus years. Uh, if after two local election, you know, both times they had strong local election showing, they are unable to tip over the presidency. I think we have to think again. When you look at Chai Ing-wen's win and realize that compared to Chen Shubian, she the DPP won the legislative yuan as well as the presidency. I don't think China has got a chance but to try to open a channel. The channel doesn't have to be leader to leader. Though Madam Chai has talked about the PRC and ROC using the language of not China and Taiwan, but the language of the two constituted uh, contending party uh, entities. Um, so that's possible, but a party to party talk, or at least a think tank to think tank talk has to be on the cards. Now, who can do that is not Singapore. Even the last time we had anything to do with this very fraught cross trace relations was when Ma Ying Zhou and she were there and they both wanted it and just looking for a place. So we were kind of a neutral zone really rather than a broker of any kind. I, I don't think that people really can uh, play any significant role on such a sensitive issue for Beijing unless Beijing comes to some rethinking. Now I'm hopeful because Madam Chai herself recently has seems to have declined to have the House Speaker of America visit her in Taiwan. She instead intends to meet him during her transit in America. This is all coming up. And again, I could be doubly wrong. You know, there's so many things I'm just taking a punt on, right? I don't know why I'm doing this when it's being telecast. But, uh, you know, I feel that her decision not to receive him in Taiwan, which was on the cards when I was there, shows a certain moderation that you do want the relationship, but you don't have to put it in the face of America. Uh, to just recollect, she has gone through transit before without much, I mean, China will have to say something, but not the kind of outrage that was shown during Pelosi's visit. Now, what she said in America uh, will bear watching, but overall, I think she's, as I said, I think she's cut, played her hand, uh, China Wen's played her hand, very disciplined, very real uh, in terms of not betraying the Taiwanese people, but not overplaying it was vis-a-vis -vis China um, or Beijing. So uh, in this sense, I think uh, if left to themselves, uh, I think the two sides have the best chance in the coming year plus not to aggravate each other and then figure out how to move. If the KMT win, a much more easy path towards a dialogue. If the DPP win, a kind of argument of necessity for Beijing. Then uh, Hong Kong itself, well, I just want to say that nobody in Singapore uh, wished this on Hong Kong. Uh, we don't regard their suffering as our benefit. I mean, those may be the facts, but it's not our wish. I just want to say that because Hong Kong is a very complicated issue. And if I was to talk about the history of it, I must, in a sense, point out that the Hong Kong people were not consulted and it's not purely China's fault. They were not consulted because the British decided not to as well. They at the most brought in some high elite and the high elite could see that there was a business interest to be had. And in this sense, if there has been a letdown of expectations, you've got to figure out what expectations were real for whom. And that is a very loaded question. 
And again, I'm looking at Victor Mallet because you know he lived in Hong Kong for quite a few years as the FT guy, and he has had the honor of being uh, uh, not allowed back into Hong Kong uh, by the Chinese authority by authorities. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's a very fraught question. I do think that uh, to have any chance with Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong will have now, maybe a bit too late, but never too late to try to treat it both for itself, but for the example in a much better way. Uh, the other question then was really uh, about Myanmar. Uh, no Hollywood ending, that's clear. I was right about that one, David. Um, the ASEAN Five Fong consensus actually is quite a bland common sense document. Uh, like for example, dialogue with all parties, a cessation to violence, but we're not there. And it's not in ASEAN's power to make it so. Uh, you described the situation very accurately. Uh, there are some called hyper-realists who wish to talk to the military. I tell them it's not clear that the SAC, the military, are gonna win. Uh, they have control over the main centers, but even then there are random bombings and in the outskirts and smaller uh, towns, that I would say they have no real handle on security. With the ethnic armed groups, of course, it's a different, much longer time scale of 50 years of endless conflict. They've never had control. It's a question of whether they can fight so many and so many fronts at one time. So the sense is that if it wasn't for Russia and other uh, uh, routes in, uh, the problems would be even stronger for the military. Now, this doesn't mean I'm hoping for military collapse. Again, I'm enough of a realist, or at least in doing the book, I'd read enough history of the country to realize that the British never left a union of Myanmar. There was no union. From the start, there was a fracture. And in that fracture, there's always been a narrative of the Myanmar military being the only unifying core I've never, in a sense, no one's seen a perfect Myanmar, but no one's seen any kind of Myanmar without the military. So I do think that we will have to, again, like a bit like Russia, to come to some sort of agreement with the devil. We may not like what they've done. I certainly don't. I've spent enough time in that country to realize that a lot of people I've known for a decade have been imprisoned, et cetera. But the realism part of me, and I'm Singaporean after all, um, is who's going to run this country? And we don't want, in ASEAN terms, to see a Syria or whichever civil conflict is your favorite. You know, we don't want people to keep arming the ethnic armed groups and arming the military so they just keep fighting forever. Uh, we don't want a black hole on the edge of ASEAN and one of our members. So we, we will have to try to come back to some sort of dialogue at some point. But while ASEAN owns the problem, it does not own the solution. Uh, the key uh, investments are like China, Japan, uh, Russia with its arms uh, and its presence uh, diplomatically, its veto powers, uh, not in that sense ASEAN. Thank you. There was another question. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And then Sophie. Thank you very much, Professor, and for, for your speech. I am Christopher Long. I am international uh, strategy consultant, and I have two questions, if if I may. One is about the uh, economical consequences of the war in Ukraine. Um, does it make sense for the South Asia countries to reconsider their dependencies on energy, on commodities, um, on what makes uh, key resources important for you? And question two is closer to South China Sea. You, you mentioned your interest for international law. And as you know, there is a debate on interpretation on this region. So what is your perspective on, 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 next, on next step regarding what is happening there? You, you, you have seen the, the shared patrols starting with the Quad countries plus plus Philippines and maybe some Asian countries are also involved in that or will be involved in that. Uh, thank you for your answer. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. A very short question on, I would like to come back. Sorry, oh, I'm Sophie Boisseau du Rocher from uh, Center for Asian Studies at IFRI. Um, I'd like to come back on the um, accession of Ukraine to the TAC. Uh, it was perceived here as a critical and highly political uh, decision by uh, ASEAN. Um, I would like to, you to come back on the uh, incentives for ASEAN to sign this accession in, uh, in a time of war. That's the one first question. And the second one is, um, and what does the uh, association expect from this uh, initiative? Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Um, let me save Sophie's very tough question for the end. Um, economic consequences for ASEAN. Um, Actually, ASEAN is doing quite well, uh, though the emphasis is on you know, recovery post-pandemic. Uh, we've seen growth rates go up. And so in the sense, while uh, 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 there's a storm in the world, we're relatively at the silver lining. It's not very broad, rich, or permanent, but we are actually seeing not just a bounce back, but a kind of uh, uh, growth in ASEAN. Uh, partly, this is a product, not so much of Ukraine, but Sino-American tensions. As the world looks for supply chains which exclude China, uh, people are investing in ASEAN. But let me add that people are doing so even before this because of ASEAN's own dynamics and relative attractiveness. So you have the South Koreans saying, let's look south. Taiwan has a go south policy. The Japanese have always been there. And I say that even China, because of costs and other issues is trying to invest in various ASEAN countries. The darling has been Vietnam, uh, but I would say uh, in certain sectors, Malaysia, Thailand have seen blips and Indonesia is on the cusp of various things. So uh, ASEAN has been doing quite well economically. Uh, the dependencies, I think, uh, rethinking Russia, uh, Russia has been a friend uh, to a number of the ASEAN countries, Thailand, Malaysia has always tried politically to in bring in uh, Russia. It's not so much the energy dependency. In fact, uh, um, the relationship is really on security and then uh, the very rich Russians and tourists, uh, I would say. Um, so, arms selling? Arms selling, yes, yes, yes. Not uh, dependent on them for security, yes. Um, because uh, America has not been willing to uh, sell and probably not sure that my ASEAN neighbors want to spend that much money. Singapore does, but uh, <laughs> per capita. Uh, anyway, so uh, we, we think that um, Russia's interdependence, the region, what we've done uh, is enough. I mean, the inflation we suffer, but there's no way around it. Uh, there's no, it's just a, a mass uh, reduction of supply. Uh, interconnection will be, uh, resilience will be our key. So ASEAN, like Singapore, we're well-minded to not just produce for itself, which I think is a fool's game for any country, but to link up with many other partners. Uh, Singapore now is doing crazy stuff like uh, buying eggs from Poland. Uh, I don't, you know, we always had chicken wings before this from Brazil, but uh, the global state of our economy, uh, our food supply is quite amazing. Uh, um, um, the hard question, uh, uh, you know, sorry, South China Sea first. Uh, South China Sea, I, I think, like I said, in oscillation, Aquino brought the case, the Tuate sort of dithered back and forth, and now the new administration, includes Tuate's daughter as vice president, uh, seems to be moving towards the American side. I, I don't know whether you've been, not just to, I've never been to the South China Sea at all, and rocks which are being contested. I have been to Manila Bay. And there you see another land reclamation with Chinese investment for a huge casino. And this is somehow welcomed by the Manila elite. Um, in this sense, uh, if you want us to emphasize that kind of business and VRI and infrastructure, China has got cards to play with with uh, any administration in the Philippines. So uh, I said earlier about Pompeo, I think it will go back and forth. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, think the present position, very pro-American, is permanent. Uh, the four bases that it's uh, 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 given, it's not 
in the scale of Subic or Clark as it was way back. So uh, how enduring it is, uh, how uh, substantive it is, I think will remain to be seen. Uh, um, on the Ukraine tech accession, that hard question. Given my analysis of how ASEAN countries were not at idiom uh, on Russia, I think uh, the, the solution was to find a, a, something that we could uh, show some responsiveness to the situation. And lowest common denominator, not only lowest, but a combinator was to have a great deal of sympathy for Ukraine and wish to show some solidarity with the Ukrainians. Uh, tech, therefore, was the solution. Now, how, what does it mean to have tech? When, of course, Russia already has tech as well, since it's part of the East Asia Summit, which ASEAN chairs. Um, I hesitate to say so bluntly, but I think this will be one of these acts of diplomacy without necessarily much substance. I don't mean to say all ASEAN is like that, but I think in this case, it was under pressure to show that sympathy and that common element. Uh, please remember, as I said earlier, when we first started off, we never thought that Hun Sen's Cambodia as chair would go so far. So the fact that it's crossed the line on at least this one issue does show a, a streak of uh, independence, which people didn't assume. And that goes back to the point about the sentiment. While I've said that, you know, the political elite haven't quite taken a pro-European stance. I don't think anyone who's been watching their cameras, uh, the TVs or YouTubes, whatever it is, could as a human being really be completely, you know, national interest only. So I think this plays out in this somewhat symbolic, but nevertheless, uh, not unimportant thing. Dipin, you had further questions, and I have one question. Sure, I especially have a follow-up question. You said earlier that uh, AUKUS creates more role for ASEAN because it creates more distrust in the region, and I was wondering to what extent you would also say that it also creates more role for the EU in ASEAN as you know, an external partner, which is not part of greater power dynamics. I am partly here because I would love to see the EU play that role. Um, I think that uh, France has its own reasons for disliking AUKUS, uh, which we shouldn't get into since I know nothing about it. But uh, the EU as a whole has, in various economic, uh, um, um, digital, and other areas, set its own standards. Now, how comparable are these to what ASEAN as a largely developed countries can do? What is the dialogue to get to a more globally acceptable standard? Uh, while this is going on, of course, the Americans are running IPEF. It's early days and nothing has really come out yet. But I would say that uh, um, IPEF exists because Americans can't stand the word TPP anymore. You know, so this is the substitute. The EU instead is coming with its own thought through policies on what can bind your various countries. Now, they may not be the same for, to, to deal with intra-regional, but it's a starting point. And I think that that's a good basis. And I think that that's why, not that I'm trying to split you from America, but if on Ukraine there is a unified West and then uh, this becomes the central issue in Asia and you, you buy into the autocracy democracy debate, then it would hinder uh, the, any EU willingness or ability to play that sort of other partner. But I'm hoping that it's not that, not so much based on the fact that it's all go and worship at the, the feet of the Chinese market, but really just simply some degree of realism and carving out this own stance vis-a-vis -vis the countries of Asia, including ASEAN, including China. I think the EU could be uh, that kind of player. Thank you. No, no more questions. So I have one question, which is about uh, uh, Indonesia. So Indonesia chaired the G20, uh, last year, and everybody expected, uh, well, Indonesia's chairmanship to be perhaps not a catastrophe, but well, <laughs> we didn't expect much. And actually, Indonesia did quite well. 
And the Bali summit in, in particular, which was uh, again expected to be a, a flop or a failure, ended up rather successfully. So that's one first thing I would like to know whether you share my assessment. And the second thing is that now that Indonesia is chairing ASEAN, what would you expect from this year of uh, Indonesia's chairing ASEAN? Thank you. I should before asking, replying, ask how many Indonesians are online. Uh, Indonesia is a very proud nationalistic country. And I think justifiably so. They've done a lot of things to improve their domestic uh, standing, the international standing, uh, not just with Jokowi, though Jokowi has brought it up even higher, but a certain platform has been built up before him, uh, especially from the SBY, SBA um, presidency onwards. It's been really a lesson for me watching Indonesia from across the water, interacting with them on many fronts, economic, environmental, they've improved a lot. I mean, though they get hell for deforestation, actually people don't realize that Indonesia's deforestation rates have slowed and more or less stopped as Brazil keeps ramping up. So it's not fair to put Indonesia in the same basket uh, as some of the other countries. Uh, in recent history, I mean, uh, there's a longer story about the deforestation and land use in Indonesia. Uh, the low expectations too, I think, are very much a Western construct. Uh, in fact, in ASEAN circles, it's almost the reverse. That is, Indonesia takes over the championship of ASEAN, the, the concern is that overly high expectations. You know, we had our share of low expectations when Brunei and Cambodia were the chair, and they didn't do so badly. Uh, you know, some Singaporeans have described, so, uh, uh, former diplomats have described Cambodia as kind of in China's hands and uh, sort of a basket case. And I guess they were former diplomats because when they stopped being diplomats, they just sort of vented these things. Um, I thought Cambodia did its duty. Uh, it, its own sense sometimes like going to see Myanmar generals, uh, but in the end, uh, backing ASEAN on that. And similarly, in the end, uh, see rethinking its relationship with Russia to a certain degree. Yeah? And the problem with Indonesia, if there is one and there's none yet, is that having that success in uh, G20, it takes that as a template for pulling the whole ASEAN along. The strength it showed in G20 is because it realizes in a very true Indonesian way that it's not the largest animal in the forest. Therefore, it had to really try to play this typically non-aligned role. Uh, with ASEAN framework, it's not the same. There is a bit of a danger that it will think it's the India of our region and SARC never works and ASEAN relatively does. See, there's a ways of giving tribute to ASEAN, <laughs> but pointing to organizations be even worse than, uh, uh, uh. sorry, that is a bad joke for both India and for ASEAN. Coming back to Indonesia, I think that it will find its plate to be very full. Uh, I think that one is the economic and post-pandemic. I am afraid that we are globally in our region going through a sort of pandemic amnesia. Uh, not enough attention given to health systems, trade resilience, all the things we were talking about, uh, say, a year and a half ago. And remember that, of course, Asia has just kind of reopened. We opened later than EU. In fact, for the two largest economies, Japan and China, they just reopened. So things are still settling. And I hope this amnesia doesn't take too long. Uh, sorry, it doesn't have to set in. We need to rebuild. We need to reconnect. We need to let the two larger economies drive growth across the region. And of course, distributively, you've got to figure out how to fix it so that uh, inequality gets better, uh, improved by, by growth. Um, Indonesia also will have various issues on the G20 regarding climate financing infrastructure. They did a very good deal on the, on the coal and uh, escaping, uh, letting go of some of their coal um, infrastructure assets uh, through blended finance. They need investment. So I think this mixture of investing for the right uh, economic and environmental outcomes will be good for Indonesia. Indonesia has emphasized for many years Myanmar. So return to the question that I wrote about and David Cameron reminded us about. I actually hope they will not do try to do too much. Because I said 
you know, really the situation, the answer comes back to the domestic players in Myanmar. The generals have realized they can't win, which they don't think they can not win. Um, and the, similarly, the opposition or the former NLD or NUG, what called, they have to realize they probably can't have it all either. Some compromise is the only possible solution uh, if there is to be some sort of peace in Myanmar. Now, I don't talk about the global peace, like, you know, curing all the problems with Rohingya, but simply to bring it back to some degree of stability, like the pre-coup days, which weren't perfect, but certainly not the disaster we're seeing now. So Indonesia there has actually very few cards. Uh, it's got the standing, but it doesn't have investment, doesn't have physical connectivity, it doesn't have many uh, carrots to give anybody uh, in the Myanmar situation. So I think rhetorically, they may have to play a large role, but behind that, I think they have to realize that there are real limits to what they or anyone in ASEAN or anyone in the world can and um, will be able to do. But overall, I think Indonesia has got the right tagline. If anyone can remember it, it introduced a new word as into my vocabulary, epicentrum. Epicenter, we know. Uh, epicentrum is the multiple of it, of growth. So while there are problems in the region, the tagline is that the region has to see its movement towards that post-pandemic, that closer economic integration. And the prior tagline to that is ASEAN matters. I'm not here to tell you all it matters to everybody, but I think it can be a good interlocutor on many issues, uh, including a better understanding and dialogue between EU and ASEAN, working perhaps towards a free trade agreement and other processes that could help development and understanding between our two regions. Thank you. I think we have to end on this positive note. <laughs> it's a very optimistic note to end with. No more comments? No? Well, if I, if, I, <laughs> okay. if I can use the six more minutes we have <laughs> to, to move minutes, the discussion oh, perhaps. Two more minutes, not even. Uh, two, okay. Okay. Yeah, to right. move the question towards the, the sea, because Singapore played a structuring role in bringing to shore the treaty on the high seas that was recently uh, adopted. And, and one of the reasons uh, for this is the role that Singapore plays, many reasons, but uh, one of them is the role Singapore plays in houses, the island of small island countries, which is really structuring. And I was wondering to what extent you would expect Singapore to play a structuring role on other issues that are very dividing uh, for this group of countries, be it China, climate uh, change, and other matters. Uh, let me first say that I'm very proud of my student, Rina, a former student, who is the chairperson of the treaty. Uh, where, you know, as a whole, we've really seen her grow not just for Singapore, but for really the international community on quite an innovative uh, um, uh, treaty. Uh, but let me also say that the treaty will have people uh, uh, questioning uh, some of its uh, use. It strongly emphasizes the environment which I support, but from a different perspective, the common use of the seas, etc., could be sort of edged out. And the linkage between the new treaty and the law of the sea, I think, will have to be clarified in a number of areas, in a kind of technical, uh, lawyer wonkish sort of thing. But overall, I think it's a step forward. Uh, the second thing I'd say is that while I'm proud of her and therefore of the Singapore government supporting her chairmanship, um, I would say that Singapore, I've just said that Indonesia shouldn't think too big. Singapore isn't big and shouldn't think too big. Um, we have had a finger also on the law of the sea when uh, Ambassador Large, uh, Tommy Koh, uh, my former professor, really um, did a stalwart job. But the law of the sea actually didn't serve Singapore's own interests particularly well. We don't have much sea uh, because all the neighbors are hemmed in so closely. In fact, some of the biggest beneficiaries in terms of the archipelago seas were our neighbors, Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, similarly, for the new treaty, I can't say that we have burnished any national interests. Uh, we, we kind of did a loyal job for the global commons. Um, I mean, not completely dis disinterested, you know, but there's no clear national interest. So 
I, and the third point I guess to make is that Singapore will play its role uh, where it can. Uh, in this overall discussion, we've had various points about Myanmar, about Taiwan in particular, Taiwan, China, and more broadly, what ASEAN might do in Ukraine. I'd say that uh, in a sense, in this storm, uh, and it is a global storm in my view, um, we'd be advised to kind of actually duck our heads all the time. We have to stand up for what we believe in, but not to venture out on every occasion into this storm. It will be a foolish errand uh, to risk too much. We've done very well. I must say Singapore has surprised many Singaporeans. Uh, when we looked at some of the pandemic numbers early on, we thought we were really in trouble. We haven't done it perfectly, but the small number of deaths uh, uh, really has, I would say, for me personally, uh, uh, led me to think the Singapore government has got some of it right. We've just done a national sort of study about this, not me personally, but the government uh, did it. And it does admit some of the shortcomings. And, but the thinking is the next one. So now I've, I'm 62 now. So I've seen us through the Asian crisis, uh, various global financial crisis, regional problems. And somehow or other, not just Singapore, but our region has been quite resilient, never perfect but resilient. And sometimes Singapore has somehow come up a little bit forward, a little bit forward on various fronts. Um, and I hope that this global storm, if we're realistic about it, engaged but not too foolishly adventurous, uh, will continue to do well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Simon, for this uh, very good conclusion. Now I think it's time to end this uh, session. And well, join me in thanking Simon for this uh, very good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So friendly.